Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at least I think it's morning. I've been up since 3 a.m. with my six month old twins. So <laughs> it's been a rather interesting morning so far. Uh, I stayed awake all through Alison's talk. Um, that's no indication of what we're talking about. I've been popping myself up with coffee all morning. So uh, hopefully, you can stay awake through this. Um, I'm here today uh, to tell you a little bit about some work that we've been involved in over the last few years in Strathairn, uh, starting with the excavation of a site at Pittenteen, followed by the construction of a reimagining of that site earlier this year. And hopefully I can be also be able to touch on some broader themes relating to the interpretation and reconstruction of prehistoric archaeological sites. I should also explain at this stage uh, that we are in the early phases of post-excavation analysis, uh, so I don't have any radio carbon dates, and uh, we have yet to look at any of the artifacts in any detail. Uh, there is a great deal of research yet to be done, so there may yet be further revelations and insights to come, which may alter the interpretations I'm going to present to you. So, the site I'm going to talk to you about today, Pitantia, uh, is located on the outskirts of Creef, around about one kilometre east of Strathurn Community Campus, along the Broich Road. And the site is situated within a field to the southeast of Pittentine Farm. Uh, the land here is you currently use the pasture and it slopes gently from north to south, uh, but there's a flat terrace at the southern end of, of the field next to the road where the site was discovered. The slope continues to the south of the road, uh, eventually coming down to the River Ern. And the site was discovered during the watching brief where we had an archaeologist monitoring the removal of topsoil from the area that you can see here in red. Uh, the area was to form a temporary access track to allow access for the construction of a new electricity tower. And the tower, which is now built, is located at the eastern end of the track in the centre of the, the roughly rectangular area you can see there at the bottom of the image. So, during this process of watching the topsoil being removed, our archaeologists came across a few bits and pieces in this area at the eastern end of the track. Uh, the rest of the track was pretty sterile uh, from an archaeological point of view, but you can see here uh, we came across uh, a couple of shallow post holes with packing stones, which, along with a couple of shards of pottery uh, and another, a, a number of other possible features, showed us that the, the site was potentially significant and, and probably prehistoric indeed. Um, we were fortunate in this case that the archaeology showed up right at the end of the track. Uh, this meant that we were under no immediate pressure to get the, the site done and recorded. Um, and we also had a nice little track to drive right along the next to the <laughs> Now, looking at these post holes in the ground, um, there appeared to be a different cluster around halfway along the trench. Uh, not all of these features here definitely held posts, but several had visible post pipes and contained packing stones. Several features also contain fragments of prehistoric pottery, uh, as well as some possible doll. Uh, but looking at these features on the ground, we, we started to see that there was some possible alignment to posts that might represent a rectilinear, rectilinear building. Um, but some of the features didn't really fit with this. So, when you look at things in plan, um, it often helps a lot just, just trying to do, join the dots with post holes. And you can see here that there's a fairly convincing case for there being two small square structures. Uh, instead of one large rectangular one. Each of these structures was approximately 2.7 metres across and was defined by three posts along each side. The presence of daub uh, suggests that these structures might have had walls, um, could they have been small dwellings. Um, there was no trace of any hearths, uh, but the shallow post holes did indicate that the site had been plough truncated, um, so perhaps shallower features such as hearths wouldn't survive. It was clear that this area had, had been the focus for prehistoric activity. And as the electrical tower was constructed just to the east of where we discovered these structures, it was decided that it would be advisable to open up this area under archaeological supervision far in advance of construction works to allow any archaeology to be dealt with. Um, so this is what we did, and you may be able to see this in the photograph that's looking from the west. Um, we uncovered a large number of features and deposits but most notably, two concentric rings of posts with a setting of four large timbers in a square at the centre. And here's what the site looks like in plan. 
You can see here uh, two selections of the concentric rings have been dug at the time this photograph was taken, uh, along with a whole range of additional features. And here's the two little square structures just to give a sense of the scale and layout of the site. I should also point out at this stage that we opened up a slightly larger area than was going to be disturbed by the, the construction of the tower, primarily because we could see that the postal rings extended outside the threatened area and we wanted to better understand the context of the site. So the area to the east of this line was exposed, but we didn't excavate anything within that. And here, just to make things a little clearer, I've highlighted the primary elements of the site. Uh, you can see here the two concentric rings of posts and the four large central posts. The outer ring was approximately 22.5 metres in diameter, the inner ring 14 metres, and the spacing of the internal posts was approximately 5.4 metres. And I was particularly interested in this measurement because it was almost exactly twice the length of the small square structures to the west of the site. Now the size of the post holes suggests that these posts increased in size from the outer to the inner enclosures. There was also some interesting features relating to the post holes, which I'll come to shortly, but um, the broader morphology of the site suggested that this was a, a timber circle, a late Neolithic or early Bronze Age monument, of which there are many in Britain, but relatively few have been excavated. For the most part, these sites are known through crop mark evidence and often appear to consist of a single circle of posts. Um, a significant high profile example of this four poster type of timber circle has been excavated at Durrington Walls near Stonehenge, as Alison mentioned earlier. <coughs> but one closer to home example, which seems to me very similar to the site of Pittantean, is one of the timber circles that Matt Muir added. This circle was discovered beneath a stone circle. This is a pattern that's seen elsewhere, suggesting that timber circles were. In some cases, at least, um, the precursors of stone circles. At Pittantean, we had no suggestion that there was a stone circle in the immediate vicinity, um, but the similarity in the plan between these two structures I think is quite striking. Um, the scales are about the same there. I've tried to get as close as I could. The four poster at the centre of the monument was defined by four very large post holes, um, and the posts which sat in these were up to 60 centimetres in diameter and the post holes into which they were replaced survived up to a metre deep. In each post hole, there was a clear post pipe, which suggests that these posts, below the ground surface at least, had rotted in situ. On top of one of these post pipes, we found a concentration of prehistoric pottery, which suggests that after the post was removed, a pot was left in its place, perhaps as a votive deposit. Perhaps one of the most significant insights in how, to, how the timber circle uh, at Pittantean might have looked was found within the post holes of the four poster. The post pipes in three of these features were very clearly angled, all flaring outwards from the centre of the monument. The fourth was not as clearly angled as the others, but was a more complex feature, and particularly as this was the feature on the top of which the pot had been placed, it may have been subjected to different treatment than the other posts. And the inner ring of posts uh, was interesting because nine of the post holes had post pipes which had quite a distinctly rectangular square profile or square profile. Um, I've attempted to highlight this photo, it's not the greatest photograph I'm afraid, and this is partially excavated, but the, the circle is the outside of the post hole uh, and the, 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 the red line there just shows you the edge of the, the post pipe um, as it was being excavated. Why would there be Timbers like this in the circle, so some of the other um, post pipes we discovered within the same ring of timbers were quite clearly circular, so why is there variation in those timbers around that ring? And I don't have any answers yet, but um, I'm in interested certainly to hear any ideas that anybody here might have. Um, in addition to the rings and the four poster, um, there were a number of other features on the site which may have related to the timber circle structure. The busiest area of the site was within a gap to the western side of the outer ring of posts. Within this area, we found large pits which contain lots of charcoal and fragments of burnt bone. Unfortunately, I can't say yet whether this material is human or animal, um, but we're going to be looking at that very soon, hopefully. Uh, we also excavated two lines of postals 
which appear to form a trapezoidal shaped structure. Several of these post holes contain fragments of possible burnt doll, perhaps indicating that the posts survived or su the posts supported screens or walls. Together with a number of other post holes and pits, these features suggest that this general area was a particular focus for activity and perhaps formed the entranceway to the monument. A number of larger postals on this side of the monument, uh, the west side of the monument, may also have related to the entranceway. There were three pit features located within the central area within the four poster as well. Um, and I was gutted because there was nothing in these that looks exactly where the treasure should have been, but it wasn't. Um, but perhaps they relate to some structural feature that was later removed or, or probably truncated away. Um, also of note, uh, within the inner circle of posts were the two large pits, uh, these two on this side, which uh, saw us all the way outside the area which we were excavating, um, so we, we didn't get to look at those in any detail, but um, they were very similar in size and shape, um, and actually close to the size of the big postals um, in the square setting, but um, we didn't see any post pipes on the surface, so we, could, we couldn't say whether or not they held posts. Um, one thing we did do was recover some burnt bone from the top of one of them uh, because we disturbed it, we wanted to get it um, lifted, so uh, we, we have something we might be able to save it was. So uh, I hope that gives you a flavour of the archaeology we encountered at Pit and Tien. Um, we'll be starting to post its work very soon, but I'm excited to see how things will pan out with that. Um, at the moment, it seems that we have a monument built from timber sometime in the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. And as it was built from timber, one might imagine that it could only have been upstanding for a relatively short period of time, perhaps a generation or so. Um, it is possible that successor monuments may have been built nearby, but no such feature was found within the excavation area. There wasn't a huge amount of charcoal recovered from the site, so there's no indication that the monument was burnt down. Um, although the pot placed on top of the post pipe uh, of, of one of those central posts shows that the collapse or destruction of the, of the monument was marked by somebody. There was very little material culture associated with the timber circle itself, um, but the pits filled with charcoal and burnt bone may provide an indication of some of the activities that occurred here, perhaps feasting or even cremation, um, and we may get some indications that, um, from what Alison was discussing earlier, the, the, the four poster could be supporting some kind of excavation platform or something like that. Um, it's all up for debate at the minute. Um, <clears throat> but those these square structures at the west side of the, the excavation area are really intriguing. They, if they are contemporary with the monument, then they're, they're pretty significant, and uh, they certainly bring to mind to me um, the, the small structures that were found down the walls, um, which have been interpreted by some as the homes of the people who built Stonehenge. When we look at the wider area around Pitantine, and this is only a very quick overview, uh, we, we don't have Stonehenge, but we do have some significant signs of a rich prehistoric landscape. Um, particularly noteworthy is the Broig Cursus, uh, which would likely predate our timber circle, but also has a crop mark pit circle associated with it. Um, so it's possible that there were a number of timber circles in the area, uh, perhaps successors to one another, or even contemporary parts of a complex ceremonial landscape. Uh, also of note, albeit slightly far, farther afield, uh, was the recent excavation of the timber circle at Ketty, as again as Alison was talking about earlier, uh, as part of the surf project. Uh, following the excavation of the pit in um, we looked to talk to the local community and let them know about our discoveries through a series of talks and events. Uh, and news of the discovery was received with a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, and the, re the idea of reconstructing the timber circle within the grounds of the new Strathairn community campus was put forward. The campus is situated approximately one kilometre to the west of the site itself, on top of the Broig Cursus, so it already has strong connections with prehistory and is a real focus for the local community, housing the Creef High School as well as the local library and sports facilities. As discussions progressed, I came to the fairly uncomfortable conclusion um, and realisation that people were actually going to want to know from me what this timber circle looked like. Um, <laughs> And yeah, how do we go about that? Um, nothing survives above ground level, or in this case, above a level of plough truncation. Um, and along with all this, I was given a deadline. <laughs> uh, 
for the actual production of the reconstruction, um, primarily because of who was going to be opening it. Um, and this meant that there was no chance of me getting any radio carbon dates or anything else useful to hang interpretations of. It. Um, fortunately for me, um, there's a reasonable amount of thought and imagination which has gone into how timber circles might have looked. Um, I particularly recommend Alex Gibson's 1998 book, Stone Engine Timber Circles, um, if you want to do a bit more uh, reading of this. But I put together a wee slide here that shows some of the variety of approaches that have been taken in both physical and artistic reconstructions. Now, one recurring theme in all these reconstructions here, apart from the one with the, the people in it, um, is the timber, which has a round profile. In many cases, this is justified by the archaeology, but in others, this is inferred from those sites that have sufficient preservation to, to demonstrate this. And in the case of Pentantia, as I've already discussed, we have an indication that some of the timbers, at least, might have been shaped. How could this affect the look of the structure? Well, pretty significantly when you start to think about it, the materials used, including the species of timber, might drastically affect the way in which the monument looked. But the timber is just the tip of the iceberg. Particularly when we attempt to reconstruct something essentially from what is likely to be a partial plan. <coughs> now, the following example hopefully demonstrates some of what I mean. Um, you can see here an archaeological plan of a site which, apart from the scale, is very similar to Pit and Tien. And this is actually quite close to the scale of our eventual reconstruction, which had to be smaller than the Pit and site. And this site was reconstructed, and this is it during that. Um, you can see that the upright timbers have been topped with lintels, and this is something that Alex Gibson certainly argues uh, might be appropriate for timber circles for two main reasons. Um, the first relates to stone ends, and I'm not going to get into that here, but uh, the second is the suggestion that lintels placed around the top of the circle of posts really reinforces that feeling of circularity, so that when you look at the, the, the timber circle, it looks like a, a series of circles rather than a forest of posts. Um, but in this case, there was another stage of the reconstruction, and we can see that it was in fact an Irish roundhouse, um, although the basic floor plan looks very much like our timber circle. Um, and this raises some interesting questions. Could the timber circle that Pitt and Tia have had lintels, or was it even roofed in some way? Did it have walls? Um, and of course, it's intriguing to consider these possibilities, but there were a couple of reasons we chose not to explore them further for the purposes of our reimagining. Um, as with any real world project in, involving contractors and suppliers, we had the constraints of time and money to consider, as well as the materials and expertise that were available to us. Our client for the excavation of the site, SSE, had kindly agreed to bear the cost, as well as to pull in favours with some of the subcontractors to get the work done. Um, but this meant that any design had to fit with what they were, with what they were willing to bear. Um, furthermore, whilst it might be tempting to make the design of the reconstruction experimental, it was felt that particularly as comp compromises would have to be made in terms of the scale of the reconstruction, we had to make it smaller to fit. Um, the best way to present the pit and chain circle to the public was to do it as simply as possible. So the decision was made to avoid attempting to make a reconstruction, but we wanted to reimagine the circle of Pitt and Tame. We wanted to create a new monument, fit for a new location, but also giving visitors a starting point for thinking about the prehistoric past. In coming to the conclusion that we needed to reimagine, rather than reconstruct the Tender Circle, we consulted with some of the people who would see the monument most frequently. Um, this was an uh, initial attempt at reconstructing the, the monument, and. I can say the school kids are pretty unreliable building material. <laughs> <laughs> the buckets were quite good, but the, the, the kids weren't. Um, <clears throat> we did get a sense of the scale of the, of the, of the, of the, the original money by doing this. So this is, uh, the school kids from pre high school have laid out where all the posts were. Um, on the original site, uh, this is the scale of the original site, but um, it's just to one side of where the urban reconstruction has actually been built. The school um, also been involved in producing some models using CAD software. Now this is all their work, it's nothing to do with me really, but they've kind of allowed me to, to look at it and use it. Um, but it did give us an idea of the, some of the variety of designs you could come up with. Um, there are some more extreme ones with uh, 
so with beams and then uh, on the, the foreshadow and now uh, these kind of visuals. Um, but this also gives the basis of a site plan which we actually use to give to the contractors and have them build or, or reimagine it. And in the end, the, the modern pit and team circle was built out of what I'm, I, I think it may be large. Um, I'm still trying to find out <laughs> for sure what it is, but this timber is treated to prevent rotting um, and it was supplied by a local sawmill. Um, the bark's been removed and the timber's pretty clean looking, um, although lots of little indentations can be seen across the surface, and these are presumably marks like the different bits of machinery used um, during felling and, and as the timber was through the sawmill. Um, the chosen location for the circle was a fairly scrubby bit of ground, um, initially intended as a wetland garden when the campus was built, um, but it was never used as such. It's on the main route into the campus, and anybody who went to the library or visiting school will walk right past it. Stepping back from the reimagining just a little bit, it's also possible to see over to the electricity tower, which now marks the location of the original site. Perhaps the most distinctive feature of the modern reimagining is that we chose to have the four central posts angled at the same pitch as the three of the, the original posts were suggested. And this creates quite an interesting effect. So when you enter the centre of the circle, it really does feel like you're entering an area which is opening up to the sky. The rest of the reimagining is, is fairly simple. It consists of two concentric rings of posts slightly graduating in height towards the centre of the monument. And the gap left in the outer ring was left to the west, which points towards the, the, the main doors to the community campus, but also um, sits pretty much for this, on, on the same orientation as the gap in the outer circle of the original monument too. The reception for the new circle amongst the local community appears, and much as one can gauge such things, to be very positive. Um, and we're lucky to have a couple of adopted locals come on to cut the ribbon in the interpretation board, but uh, they officially opened the monument and a great day it was had by all. Um, I visited several times since it was constructed and uh, watched children playing around the monument, people walking amongst the timbers, uh, and reading the information board was erected beside it. Um, I've also heard that the school drama club have used the circle for Macbeth, which is interesting, I can guess which scene that is as well. Um, <laughs> And there is a good chance the circle will be used for musical recitals in the future. And neither of these are uses which I anyway envisaged um, when this, this idea was first mooted, so uh, I think it's great. Um, the reimagining and information board, rather than presenting a series of academic statements, forms a frame onto which the interpretations can be hung. It uh, hopefully allows visitors to form their own interpretations of what the circle looked like and was used for whilst providing some context. If nothing else, the reimagining forms a strong focal point on the way into the campus and a link between the modern, a modern community centre and the prehistoric past. There's now an appetite for more prehistory at the community campus and plans are afoot for further information boards. Um, I believe Kenny Brophy's working on a, a cursus board at the minute, so that should be good. Um, and we're also looking at the possibility of having some lighting installed to make the circle even more striking, particularly in dark winter evenings. Um, I really hope you can find the time to get along and have a look at it. It's free to visit, and assuming you can find a car parking space, it's pretty accessible. <laughs> and that's us. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.